righteousness. God loves righteousness. God loves practicing righteousness. It is innately fulfilling to practice righteousness. That's what I've been saying. The Bible confirms that over and over and over again. What is righteousness is the big issue here. Our ideas of righteousness and God's idea of righteousness are two different things. Our ideas of righteousness are pretty much keyed to a fundamental assumption that the thing we call righteous has its own property to some degree of being good in itself. If that definition were true, and it's not, then nothing is righteous except God. Because nothing has an intrinsic property of good in it. And of course we know that from the Bible, from Isaiah 64, 6, and Romans 3, 23. Isaiah 64, 6 says, even men's righteousness is like a menstrual rag. Okay, and um, nida, which is the Hebrew word, means menstrual rag. It's a literal word. I think it's used in the plural. And um, that's also one of the names of the books. Um, of the uh, Talmud. Is it the ta yeah, Talmud. Which regards ceremonies and rules and stuff like that during menstrual times. So it's literal, okay? It's not figurative. It means unclean. In that sense. And Romans 3.23, of course, says that everybody's sin and, second prong of the indictment, and come short of the glory of God. Now, the Greek verb, hamartano, literally means to miss the mark. You're shooting an arrow and you don't hit the target. And it's usually translated to sin. Okay? But it means to miss the mark. In other words, the, the essence of sin is you're trying to get something the wrong way and it doesn't work. That's why God calls it sin, because it doesn't work. Okay, but now we're getting to the fundamental. What is righteous? Well, we say, well, only God is good. Yes. And Christ said that to the guy who, you know, asked him, why do you call me good? Only God is good, that verse. Okay, but why is that true and what does that mean? At the very heart of things, righteousness is righteous because God says so. And God does what he does to everything other than God to make it righteous, and he flat pronounces it so. The sins go into Christ and he pronounces us righteous. He just flat says so. There is no intrinsic connection between the sins going into Christ and God's pronouncement. He wanted to do it that way. Christ wanted it done that way. The Holy Spirit wanted it done that way. It got done that way and he pronounced us paid for. That's arbitrary. The things that are made by God of themselves are not God quality. They have an independent existence and independent life and therefore cannot be God quality even though made by God. Trees 
were made by God. Animals made by God. Yeah, they can procreate after that. But the first group, God had to make it. Angels made by God. They have free will. They can sin. They did. Some got saved. Some didn't. Or some, or they all can still be saved. You know, that's the big debate in theology. My pastor sat on both sides of that question. Initially, and for the most part of his career, teaching that, yes, angels had a salvation because there is such a thing as elect angels. That's how we understand it. That it's parallel. And then just before he, he you know, um, retired, he flipped over and said, no, angels, the fallen angels don't have a salvation. And he went to some lengths to explain it, but only for a few teaching lessons, and then didn't return to the topic so far as I know. So I'm going with the earlier teaching that he taught for longer, because that one I can make sense. God would have to be paid for all sin. If he gets paid for all sin, then um, there has to be a salvation for everybody, including angels, because, you know, Satan sins. God had to get paid for it. End of story. Now, it still goes back to the heart of the question, which explains much more about why Satan rebels, which is the point of this series. What is righteous? Righteousness is whatever God says it is. Because he says so. So practicing righteousness is whatever God says it is. Because he says so. And therefore the fulfillment, which was the topic of the earlier increments, why is it innately fulfilling to practice righteousness, even if you get nothing for it, even if the thing you're practicing on has absolutely no value whatsoever? Why is that fulfilling? Because he says so. It is not because there's anything actually valuable about the process or anything actually valuable about the thing you're doing. You're going to think it's valuable. You will find it fulfilling. That will be an actual experiential result every single time. It will be fulfilling even if you get nothing from it. But that's true because he says so. He's using his omnipotence to make it true. This is how God acts on everything. This is Romans 8, 28. God makes everything work together for good. Agathos, Greek verb there, a Greek noun there, is used to signify divine good. Yeah, divine good is whatever God says it is. It's ultimately an arbitrary, juridical statement by God, and it wouldn't be true if he didn't say so. He's making it true. There is no intrinsic value in a pair of shoes. I'm going to think there's an intrinsic value if I'm wearing the shoes because they protect me from whatever dangers there are when I walk on the ground. Or I like the look or the feel. But those are actually my own judgments about the shoes, not the, the actual value of the shoe. Getting my drift here? You and I both look at the same pair of shoes. You might not like them, but I do. The reasons you don't like them, you can tick off as bullet points. The reasons I like them, I can tick off as bullet points. It's the same pair of shoes. You don't like them, and I do. You put them on, and I put them on. You don't like the way they feel, I like the way they feel. You don't buy them, I do buy them. It's the same pair of shoes. What's the real value of the shoes? beauty is in the eye of the beholder now granted if the shoes what do you want to call it fall apart after a couple of wearings there's obviously some objective lack of value in the shoes but if you got two pairs of shoes one pair of shoes that actually lasts a long time then everything else about it is subjective valuation by the wearer. 
Okay, well, all existence is subjective to what God calls it. Now, Calvin was trying to get at this all along, and every Calvinist you'll talk to, depending on how PC he is, he will or will not admit to the fact that evil exists because God allows it, and it couldn't exist if God didn't want it to. And they're right when they say that. What they're missing is, they're trying to say that God is constrained by his attributes, and that's flat wrong. The whole idea of, what, of righteousness couldn't exist except God authored it. God saw the light and it was good. We see that very first in Genesis. God called it good. Because he says so. Is light naturally good in and of itself? Well, I don't know. We call it good. We all call it good. But why? And you and I can sit there and say, well, see, if there weren't light, nothing would grow, yaddy yaddy. Okay, but why do things grow due to light? Because God designed it that way. Would light be good if things didn't grow due to light? And you know, there's lots of kinds of light that destroy, like fire, for example. But we call fire good too. Oh, because fire warms and fire does this and fire does that. Yeah, and fire does a lot of destructive things too. In fact, the thing that's bad about fire is the thing that's good about fire. Because all the good things about fire that we call good are the very same things that actually are destructive. In order to warm us, it has to burn wood. Or burn something else. And the burning that it does destroys the thing that it burns. So we're pretty subjective too. If it burns the things we like burning, we call it good. If it burns the things we don't like burning, we call it bad. Atheist has a whole lot of grounds for getting ticked off at God, don't you think? This is why Satan's ticked off. His argument is that God is arbitrary. That everything in God's design is what God want, says, and it wouldn't exist if God didn't say so. He's just one big power person who's pronouncing righteous what he does because he just says so. And that's true. So this whole trial is about, well, is God's decision actually righteous or not? How God uses his power. What did God create? How did he create it? Did he really create it good? And of course, if you don't really, how do you want to call it? If you don't really think about your own faith, and sooner or later he's going to beg the question in your life. If you don't really beg, think about your faith, you're just always going to parrot the mantra. God is love, God is good, God is righteous, God is omnipotent. Oh yeah, do you understand what those things mean? Our ideas about what's good and right and true are based on things that God arbitrarily said. And then well, since we have such a narrow view of them, and since we like sin too, we think moral sins are also good. You know, it's good to be self-righteous. So many Christians are self-righteous. And they consider themselves good. They don't know that that's a sin. But you see, all of our premises are based on things that are already created in our minds. And, you know, we have an imperfect idea of what those things are. We don't really go back to the, to the like, the intrinsics and say... Well, wait a minute, I'm calling this righteous and this not righteous. Why is that true? Why should it be true is really the right question. God designed the whole thing and he says this is what it is. It wouldn't be that way if he didn't say so. It's only staying that way because he says so. He says it's fulfilling to practice righteousness. Well, he's defining every single term in that statement himself. Why 
should that definition be the definition? That's the heart of the trial. What other definition could there be of righteousness? What other definition could there be of fulfillment? What other definition could there be of practice? Right? Practicing righteousness is innately fulfilling. Each one of those words, what other definition could there be or should there be that would be better than the definition God himself has authored? That's what the trial's about. Because fundamentally, what we're looking at here is an arbitrary definition of all things, including truth, righteousness, justice, love, every single word and concept in your head is some variant of what God created and calls by those names. I say variant because, you know, we have free will to sin and so we come up with our own ideas okay fine we're being arbitrary too what I'm trying to say is that everything in life if it says God works everything together for good that's his definition of good the thing itself is not good of itself cannot be because it's not him Okay, but then is God innately good? He says so. We say so. Does that make it true? No. Okay, then if it's not true, what would be better? Now, that's a really hard thing to come to grips with. And your typical atheist will end up telling you that all truth is subjective. And now you've got grounds to agree with them. Yeah, it's subjective. God created the whole thing, created even truth. He just flat wills that this thing that I do is righteous and this other thing is not righteous. I just flat will to put my omnipotence into everything to make good on it by my definition of what good is. That's totally subjective. And Satan's busy saying God's definitions of things are flawed, wrong, shouldn't be true, and he should win instead. And he's free to win instead, and God's going to let him win instead if he actually wins, which we already know he won't. Not because God's going to force it. Which in a way is the ultimate statement about why it is fulfilling. Because God, it doesn't matter if Satan wins. God still gets to practice what he calls righteousness. And that's innate, that's fulfilling to him because he says it's fulfilling. That's how he uses his omnipotence. To make righteous on everything no matter who wins. By his definition of what righteousness is. Is he right? Do we agree with him really is what it boils down to. Do we agree with God's own definitions of things? And as you live your life down here, that's really what you're doing. You're voting for God or Satan, which I've been saying from the beginning. I just didn't understand until right now just how total this battle was. It's about the definitions. It's about God's design and God's definition for the design versus any other kind of truth that you want to even pretend could be. And now I understand much better why, you know, one third of the angels went with Satan. And probably why, you know, 90% of mankind, if not more, is voting with Satan. They don't like God's definitions. And fundamentally, that's really what it boils down to. Do you agree with the God's definitions of things? Or do you agree with the other guy? Yes or no? Daily basis. Here's how God defines things. Here's how he uses omnipotence. It's total. It means that all unrighteousness must be allowed. He didn't cause evil by what we call evil, which is pretty much not always what he calls evil. 
But he allows it, and that's where we have our problem. The atheist who's an atheist will pretty much say to you that if evil lives in the world, then there cannot be a God, or if he, there is a God, it's not a God the atheist wants to know. And you can empathize with that. God allows un all maximum unrighteousness to exist because he defines truth as having as being free to be what it is. Okay, but in a way you have to argue that God's constantly gerrymandering things too. Because he could stop it from existing. But instead of doing that, he's making good on it, sort of like baptizing meanings on it that, you know, how does he make good on the rape of Nan King? How did he make good on the Holocaust? How do you make good on something like that that's really good? Isn't it gerrymandering to say, well, here's what I'm doing to it, and I'm calling that good. Is that really good enough? A lot of people will tell you no. It's, it's a hard thing to live with. No wonder the puppets don't really break this down and really give you much more than the pablum of God is good, God is righteous, God is truth, God is justice, and don't even bother to explore what that means. Because if they did, they'd get to this point in this audio. Righteousness is whatever God says it is, but does that really make it righteous? That's the argument. That's what this trial is fundamentally about. Now, I have a problem with this myself. But I'm voting with him. If his choice, his idea, his definition, this is what he's using his omnipotence to, to do, is to you know, live out this definition that he himself arbitrarily makes because he feels like it. But it's him. I'm voting with him. Right or wrong. It's not about anymore, you know, avoiding hell or whatever else that might have been in the past. This his choice is him. Good, better, and different. Even if you were janitor rather than God. I know how he thinks. I know why he thinks what he thinks. I know him better than I know myself. And fundamentally, yeah, he's arbitrary. And we know from the Bible what his thought pattern is, what his decisions are, why he makes them. But what I didn't know until today is that there's no intrinsic value at all to anything God makes. He has to create the value in every case. He has to pronounce the value, and it's flat, 100% dependent on his definition, and that it of itself has no definition, has no value. Now, relatively speaking, you know, human versus animal down here, I can sit here and say, well, a pair of shoes that only last, you know, two wearings has no value compared to a pair of shoes that last several years. Okay, but that's still a pronunciation on my part. I'm still making a justice call. You can see the, you know, what do you want to call it. While brain outs call makes sense versus somebody else who equates two pairs of shoes, one that lasts a long time and one that doesn't last. You can see why Brainout would say the second pair, the one that lasts, is worth more than the pair that doesn't last. And that's sort of the same kind of mindset we're going to go through when it comes to evaluating, you know, God's choices of what's good and bad versus anybody else.
But in the final analysis, he goes down so low to the bottom. Making good on a speck of dust? Why have the speck of dust be there in the first place? Can't all the making good on that speck of dust that you want to do, couldn't you have used some other justification to do the same things without the speck of dust even existing? That's a decent argument to make. So why didn't God do it that way? Why have P exist? And there's some other mechanism God could have created for, you know, um, the dispersal of waste? Why create it that way? Why put the reproductive organs and the sex organs and the P organs all next to each other? Why do you do it that way? That was pre-sin. I mean, that means he has to watch billions of people in billions of years that never dies. He has to watch them pee. That doesn't make any sense. What possible value is there to God in doing that? None. You see why Satan thinks something's wrong in God's thinking? And I don't have an answer to say why that was a good idea. Why do you make it pleasurable? We're going to say, well, it's got some value, it's pleasurable. Okay, but that's arbitrary on our part. Why, does, why do we say that a thing that is pleasant has more value than a thing that is painful? And if that were actually true, or validly true, or ought to be true, then why does pain exist at all? Why should pain exist at all? And you say, well, without pain you can't get certain benefits. Yeah, but that's only because God designed it that way. Why couldn't he have designed it in another way so whatever value you got out of suffering pain, you could get out of without suffering pain? Why couldn't he associate the same benefits to something that doesn't have pain? See, this is a war too. It's a war over definitions. Because fundamentally, everything that exists is simply because God wants it to. So this is a war of independence. This is a war over do you choose God or Satan. And at the most um, fundamental level, it's a war over why God chose what he chose. And do you choose the same way? And why? And if you ask me, well, Brain Up, what's your answer? I, I, all I can tell you is I choose him. And I guess that just makes me arbitrary because every choice that Satan makes, I pretty much understand now. And I see why God's choices are better. But fundamentally, it's just because I choose God. So I'm being subjective, too. So I guess I understand why the pulpits don't actually get this deep into the character of God. Because when you look deep into it, the truth of the matter is, everything is what it is because he says so. And why is that a better answer than had he designed it differently? And my answer to all these questions still ends up being, your God, I'm not, that's all I know. And really, that's all I want to know. I, I really basically wish I were dead. And the only reason I want to keep on living is because he does so I guess I'm arbitrary too. I don't have a better answer. Okay, so now let's look at how Satan counters. Everything Satan says and does is based on something God says for two reasons. 
First of all, because he's created by God. So his whole thought process is a stunted, incomplete maturation in God's own thinking. The second reason he does it is because his idea of victory is to beat God on God's own strengths. My pastor made a big stink about that when he covered Matthew 4. I want to say that it was in his 1992 Spiritual Dynamics series beginning about Lesson 800 where he started to cover um, what he calls, and others too, uh, occupation with Christ, which is the ultimate way to solve problems. It's a last stage in spiritual growth, too. <clears throat> and the looking at Christ in order to solve problems, keeping your eyes on him, is the method that a mature person actually lives on to get through the day. So therefore, it's a problem-solving device. But it's also a mental attitude and it's also an outlook on life. And that's what completes you in maturation and takes the rest of your life. It, it begins sometime in spiritual maturity and if you stick with it, it lasts until you die. And that can be a long time or a short time. Um, the term occupation with Christ was not coined by my pastor. I'm not really sure who invented it, but it was used by Watchman Nee also with a kind of a different idea. And Watchman Nee didn't really understand the spiritual life that well, but was trying. Um, so he was around in the 1930s until the 1970s. My pastor, um, I want to say, graduated from, uh, you know, got his degree and therefore was able to enter the ministry sometime in the 1950s. I want to say in 1950 or just before. So the term must have been around at the beginning of the 20th century. But I don't know who started it. It's a very apt description. When you are mature, you are occupied with Christ. But maturity, like everything else, is a matter of, you know, gradations. So you can be just mature or more mature, or maximum mature. You get the idea. The point being that Satan didn't get there. Wherever the angelic level of maturity was that for him he had to get, because even maturity is an individual thing. No two mature people are alike. He didn't get to whatever was his personal full maturation for him. And therefore he became bitter, therefore he became stunted the whole bit. That's why he's he plays to strengths. In Matthew 4, and my pastor had covered this, when Satan's tempting Christ, he's tempting him based on Christ's own strengths. The temptations he picks, the way he picks to phrase them, the, the tone of voice, the whole bit is based on Satan's own observation of Christ and is designed to hit him where it hurts the most and to hit numbers of emotions at once all along a spectrum. Okay? So that the humanity would just, like, overload and revert to deity to reply. That was what Satan was trying to do, was bypass humanity. Like in the first temptation... Um, to get Christ to even imagine bread, because he's God and man, if he even imagined bread, okay, imagine turning stones into bread, which is a natural human thing to do when you're very hungry. If he had even done that, then it would have turned to bread, because he is God. You know, that's first class condition in the Greek when Satan's tempting him, and that means yes, and it's true. And, you know, some scholars will tell you, yes, and it's true as an assumption, but it doesn't mean that the, the speaker thinks that it's true. It doesn't matter. Okay? Of course, Satan, the temptation itself wouldn't mean anything if Christ wasn't God. It wouldn't be a temptation because only God can turn stones into bread. Okay? So, Satan is tempting him to do that. 
it wouldn't have, you know, if he's not God or he just doubted whether he was God and Satan was tempting him to test whether he's God, as some stupid theo- so-called theologians think, um, then it wouldn't have been a sin. You get that? It's only a sin if he's not supposed to use DD he already has. So that just shows that half of your theologians can't think their way out of a paperback. All right, yes, and it's true. Yes, he's God, and it's only a temptation because he's God. For his humanity to use is Godness. That's the temptation there. The same temptation is in the second and the third. In the second temptation, use your Godness to make a safe landing. Third temptation, use your Godness to destroy Satan out of anger at the stupidity of the temptation. Okay? So, there you go. They're all temptations for Christ to use his godness in order to win. But he didn't want to do that. Now, that right there tells you what Satan does with everything God does. God says a thing is righteous. Well, is it really? Should what God calls righteous really be righteous? That's the argument going on in the human race. We're all making opinions about that. You believe in Jesus Christ and you're safe forever. Is that fair? Most Christians don't even know that's the gospel because they don't think it's fair. They call it easy believism. And they think something's wrong. And they invent extra conditions like you have to repent of your sins to be saved. Whoopee, what's that going to do? Oh, I feel bad about the fact I sinned. So because I feel bad about what I did wrong, that somehow makes me worthy of being saved. Give me a break. Or you have to do penance. Or you have to do some good deed to atone for the past bad you did. That's a pagan concept. The pagans were all about personal redemption for past bad things you did by means of personal future good works you do. And the Quran is completely full of that. That's its idea of salvation. Believing in Allah is not enough. Allah weighs your life in the balance and it's the same thing as the river sticks and the god Isis when you die and Osiris. They look at your life and the bad you did versus the good you do. And if the latter outweighs the former, you get to cross the river and go into paradise, which is a Persian word. That's all pagan. And that's what most Christians are trying to turn the gospel into. Because at root, everybody wants to be able to say they got into heaven or a nice afterlife because they did good or they were good. That they earned it. As if, you know, salvation was something you worked at like a job. And you got paid for it at the end. That's exactly what salvation is not. God's idea is, uh, it's not good if it's not my level, so I'm going to add humanity to myself, this is the son talking, and I'm going to pay for it by means of Father just flat declaring it paid because I just flat declare that I want to to let the sins hit me. Those are arbitrary decisions made by the Godhead. Is that a fair decision? That's what this whole war is about. So Satan's going to be busy promoting works, which from time immemorial has been, okay, you did these bad things, now you do these good things, and therefore the bad things and the good things are weighed in some kind of balance. Every single pagan religion is based on this idea, including the Quran and the Islam. And when weighed in the balance... Also arbitrary, mind you, by Osiris or whatever the god's name is, you get to go to the nice place instead of the nasty place. And of course, in the reincarnation religions, you have to keep reincarnating until your past bads are paid for by your future goods, as many lifetimes as it takes. That's basically the difference in the human race with with religion. And most Christians are trying to insert pagan ideas on the Bible 
because they too find that it's completely unfair that this other person just simply does what he does and even an axe murderer can just believe in Christ and go to heaven forever. Yeah, that's true. So is God arbitrary? Well, yeah. But isn't the other idea arbitrary too? Who's to say how many goods you do in the future atone for the bads you did? And pretty much every occult TV program, TV series like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, um, what do you want to call it, um, Charmed, all those, oh, we're doing good and, and our good cancels out our past bad. Really, says who? I'm dead serious. Says who? You killed somebody in the past. How many, and, and the idea that they always promulgate is, well, you killed one person in the past, so you saved two afterwards. Therefore, the one that you killed gets canceled out by the two that you saved. Really? Is every life of equal value? I don't think so. An axe murderer's life is not worth the same as somebody who devoted his entire life to doing good. And if you killed a child, well, which way would the child turn out? And if the axe murderer, who was an axe murderer, got to live by, what, putting a dollar in the collection plate? And what about who the axe murderer killed? If that person had lived one more minute than the axe murderer who killed him. Okay, so see, the axe murderer kills John Doe. Okay, John Doe was a really good person at the time the axe murderer killed him. Okay, but what if John Doe lived ten more minutes, or two days, or five days, and did something really heinous, even if it was by accident? You know, by accident it hits a gas leak, and it kills 25,000 people. Then wasn't it a good idea that John, that, that John Doe got killed when he did, so that 25,000 people were spared? You see, who makes the judgment calls on these things? And your judgment call as to whether the axe murderer was a good person or not or how much he needs to atone is going to be different from my judgment call. Because you and I aren't going to look at all the facts the same way and we aren't going to have all the same facts. So who's going to, who's going to run the, the judgment call? See, we don't think through these issues. We just say, oh, you know, somebody's an axe murderer, well, they should go to hell. Really? Who, 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 what would have been the outcome if they hadn't done that? And what would have been the outcome to the third generation, the sixth generation, the tenth generation? In other words, had there been no Hitler, what would have happened? It's natural, and I'm part of that same group, to assume that Hitler ought to go to hell because of what he did. Okay, but it wasn't just Hitler in, who did the killing. Actually, Hitler just inspired the killing. He didn't do any killing himself. It was all those other people who did the killing. So why are we blaming Hitler? Although I personally would love to stick a knife in his throat. And I hate the guy. I really do. He makes me sick to my stomach. But you know what? He didn't do any of the killing. It was the other people who did. And a lot of those people only saw him at a distance. So it was their own evil ideas that made them do that. I mean, how stupid and sick do you have to be to want to experiment on Jewish skin to turn it into a lampshade? A lot of that was done. And who's sicker, the guy that did it or the guy who bought the lampshade? So you see, there were millions and millions of people who had sick minds during that time. You gonna cast them all into hell? To me, that's a pretty tempting proposition. But maybe not to you. Because they did a lot of good deeds. They raised their kids up moral, except for the, the Jewish problem. No, well, see, they're only against the Jews, but they were nice otherwise. Well, hello... It's okay to be nasty to the Jews, but it's offset by how nice they were to other people? Really? See, who's going to make the judgment call? Now, look at this. 
Satan's position is that there is an intrinsic worthiness or demerit to everything in life. And that these things can be added up or subtracted and weighed in the balance and that what you do okay, is a measure of who you are. And that your quality as a person is determined by what you do. You see how thorny that is? And who's going to adjudicate all this? We humans are busy trying to adjudicate all this down here because we subscribe to that idea. And look at the mess we're in. And guess what? These kinds of ideas, we all differ on the, on the answers. And we fight with each other. And that's what we've always done. So how is that heaven? So we got two things going on here. We got a set of ideas that all claims that, oh, well, you know, goodness should hit you if you do good, and badness should hit you if you do bad, and when you do bad in the past, you have to atone for it, and that theoretically, or of course the allegation is that it's true, that you actually can atone for what you did wrong in the past. Really. All of our concepts in life are based on this idea. But how can you ever atone for anything? You lied to your fifth grade teacher about a pencil you stole. Okay, that time is gone now. You can't do anything to atone for that lie. Not a thing. The fact is you cannot atone for it. Society will arbitrarily set up some kind of what it calls a justice system where you allegedly pay back for what you did wrong. But really, that's all arbitrary. That's standards that the society sets. It's up to them. So how is that different from God being arbitrary? And above all, why is it better? How can it be better? You can't turn back time. If you could turn back time and do the whole thing over again so that you didn't lie to your teacher about the stolen pencil in the first place, and ideally you didn't even steal it in the first place, well, that would be a true atonement. The effort it took for you to turn back time, to undo the deeds so that it wasn't done in the first place so you wouldn't have to lie about it. That would be an atonement. Okay, but you can't do that. You can't turn back time. So how can you ever really atone for anything? And uh, most importantly, who's going to call the shots about what atones and what doesn't? It's not working in our world. We create all these laws about these things. All of our laws are based on this idea of some kind of intrinsic value in what you do and intrinsic demerit in what you do wrong, which is offset by some kind of penalty or this or that or the other thing. And yeah, we accept those rules and we say that so-and-so has paid the penalty, paid the price, the person is free now, yaddy yaddy. But the damage that got done still got done. There's no undoing it. And my set of standards about what pays in your set are going to be different. So we go to court over our differences. And then some judge arbitrarily says, well, this one's fair and this one's right and this one's wrong. And then we agree to that. But it's all subjective. So Satan is playing the subjective game, accusing God of being subjective, which we have to argue, yeah, he's being arbitrary. But he's basing an entirely different premise. Satan's premise is that things have an intrinsic value of themselves apart from God. And that we should be using those intrinsic values of themselves apart from God in order to value our relationships, in order to accredit or demerit for salvation. And that's the plan he wants, and that's why good works is so important to it. You see why the good deeds thing is wholly satanic? 
The fact is that God had to create everything. So anything he creates is less than him, so therefore cannot have value. Any value that's going to be in anything that God creates, God's going to have to attach himself to it and bless it and baptize it with a divine value or it has no value at all. But if God's blessing it, baptizing it with a divine value, then it doesn't need to have a value of its own. It can have any value of its own, high, low, zero, less than zero, totally negative, even sins imputed to Christ on the cross, which is about as negative as I can imagine. And God flat pronounces us righteous because that happened. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Okay, so which is better? This is the vote. This is the war. This is the, the satanic counterpart. Which is better? God's flat pronouncement that you're righteous because absolutely nothing that he makes is ever going to be as good as him to start with. So he just flat has to attach himself to everything in order for anything to ever have any value, bad or good. And then it has a value he ordains for it. That's situation one, the God side of the trial. Situation two, the Satan side of the trial, well, everything has its own values, of an intrinsic value, high or low or in between, and there's some kind of scales that's used, and everything you do has a value in between, and you have to earn your salvation, and you have to earn the respect of your peers, and you have to earn this, and you have to earn that, and when you do something bad, you have to pay for it with something you earn. That's the choice. And that's Satan's counter. Good deeds. Without God being involved. And that's what the world votes for. And look at the result. We're all fighting with each other over this. Who's better than somebody else? What's better than somebody else? Condemning the thing we call bad, praising the thing we call good. And aren't we subjective too? Just like God is? Now, it then boils down to an argument about whose subjectivity is superior. We know Satan's subjectivity very well. We're using it every day. You can't walk through you can't get up in the morning without using it. Oh, this is better than this. This is better than this. I got to get up because I got to go to work, which means I got to earn a living. And yes, I'm actually, my earning a living really is earning something because I'm buying food and clothing and shelter. Notice how shallow that is? But you can't get up in the morning without that reasoning. And you really do have to do that. That's the whole satanic plan in a nutshell. See, the minute Adam sinned, he had to work. The minute Adam sinned, he made fig leaves to cover his genitals because his genitals gave him pleasure. And the fig leaves felt itchy. And so now he's punishing himself and atoning. For a sin that didn't have anything to do with sex. Had a whole lot to do with the fact that he was married to the woman. And so now he's blaming his desire for the woman. And punishing himself and thinking he's atoning by wearing itchy fig leaves. That's the whole mindset we live under. Is that better? Or is God's idea better? That since anything he creates is insufferably less than him to start with, he's just going to attach himself to everything, no matter how high and how low, how good or bad, even sins on a cross, and then pronounce it all righteous because he's attached to it. Whose subjectivity, whose arbitrariness is better? God's? Or this counter of Satan's, which is reflected in the itchy fig leaf thing? Your call.